visible on the back. Here. <laughs> you get lost. So it's getting a little cut off. Becomes a problem, let me know. But I, we, we won't be using uh, PowerPoint uh, too much, so uh, there'll be most uh, quite a bit of blackboard and uh, work and discussions. So maybe when I need to bring up some pictures of experiments or some other things, I might use the computer mostly. Okay, hello. I'm Guru Devdar. I'm going to be teaching the special topics course on uh, quantum optics and quantum information. Um, so, right now, of course, as you all know, quantum computing, quantum information, quantum communication is an extremely hot research area. Many of you are probably, I think I see some of you are all graduate students here at Pitt are working on this topic. Um, and so we'll go around a little bit and also I'd like to uh, get to know you and uh, learn what you're working on and what you might be interested in hearing about. Uh, but before I do that, let me just, I've passed around uh, the syllabus for the course to everyone, hopefully you receive it. Um, so I'll just quickly go through the course organization, uh, fairly straightforward. We'll have lectures here, 11 to 12.15. If I have to cancel sometimes for reasons of travel, et cetera, then, or sickness, I'll let you know hopefully in time, and then we might have to have one or two catch-up lectures later on at some time that's common to, to us. Um, okay, so a lot of the information is now available on the website, courseweb.pit, the syllabus is also there, if you want to look at it there. Uh, the main, uh, way in which we will assess your work in this course is through the homework. Homework assignments will be posted each Thursday, typically due the following Thursday. And I'll accept late homeworks, just give you 10% penalty for each day. Okay. Um, with homework, since the largest uh, portion of the results in this class are from the homeworks, I expect you to do them independently. You can talk to other students, but write up your solutions independently. The other part of your present of your assessment is on a final project presentation and a written report on some topic, typically of some uh, very current research area, uh, either in quantum optics or quantum information. Uh, I will, um, you know, grade all that, uh, grade all those based on sort of, and I'll assign those topics later on in the. Okay, so recommended uh, textbooks. Um, the final grade is computed 75% as a homework, 25% presentation plus a okay. The lectures, as I said, um, are, not, are, are going to be the main part of this class, are going to be mostly on the chalkboard. Uh, they won't follow any one particular textbook. I'll be taking different sections from different textbooks as needed. Uh, whenever I am referencing a particular text, I'll try to be careful and point it out, but I might forget. Uh, if, if you are not sure, you want to read it up more in detail later, let me know. I'm also going to try and provide you with the written uh, lecture notes uh, whenever possible. But I can't promise every time that I do that, but I'll do my best. Um, the, as I said, the uh, textbooks, the first three in this list, Elements of Quantum Optics by Meister and Sargent, Quantum Optics by Walls and Milburn, and then Fundamentals of Quantum Optics and Quantum Information by Lambropoulos and Petrosian. These three textbooks are actually available for free online with the Pitt Library. So you can go online to read them. Uh, you don't need to buy them. Uh, then there are these other three books, or uh, four books down here. Um, uh, one is sort of like very, uh, Important book in the field, which is Quantum Optics by Scully and Zuberi. Um, I'll probably follow that also for some very important sections on open quantum systems. Uh, then there's a recent couple books, uh, I mean this book, Quantum Optics by Mark Fox. It's a nice, I would say a little bit more undergraduate level presentation. 
So if there are some aspects that you know has been a while since you've looked at, or if those are some aspects that you would like to look at at a slightly lower level, then you can look at that uh, textbook. Uh, it has a lot of the important concepts and physics, but maybe it doesn't have as much of the rigor of details that you might need to follow some graduate level uh, work. Uh, and then finally, the last two parts, uh, which sort of indicate uh, you know that the last one third of the course is on quantum, or maybe even maybe slightly more than that, is on quantum information, right? This course is quantum optics and quantum information. So we will be discussing uh, those uh, uh, fra from those textbooks. Uh, the main, this is the Bible of uh, quantum information textbooks, Nielsen and Chuang. Not the greatest book, but still it is the Bible, so I put it out there. Um, it is a little bit hard to follow at times, and a little bit, um, but it has an exhaustive amount of material. And then the other book which I like is uh, Quantum Computer Science by David uh, Burton. So between all these books, I think you have plenty of references, textbooks to look at, to supplement the course notes. And uh, so let me then uh, tell you a little bit how I've sort of decided to um, uh, cover the material. And um, uh, if you look at the course schedule in your uh, syllabus, I kind of give a week by week outline of what I'm planning to cover. Okay, and so I should mention that although I've put a lot of topics here, I probably will not be able to cover given the sort of the week by week outline, I won't be able to cover every one of these in detail in the class. So I'll try to cover parts of them which I've deemed the most important. For the rest, I'll give you supplementary notes to read on those aspects so that you have them. But I may not go into all the details of the derivation in the class because it becomes hard in the class to go through every equation and every step. But I'll try to supplement it with my notes and, and so on. So, um, so yeah, so to begin, we are right now in the first week, we're going to do introduction and overview, and I'll probably launch into the review of quantum mechanics almost right away, uh, and the classical optics. Uh, and then, um, as shown here, we'll go through first the, uh, probably the thing that you will most encounter in many, uh, 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 Many graduate, uh, any graduate level work or PhD level work, which is uh, you have to understand the fundamental semi-classical treatment of an atom interacting with a classical field first. Okay, so we'll go through all that, which involves all these different topics, some of which you've probably seen, like Rabi oscillations and spin resonance. But then we'll generalize to multi-state systems. We'll talk about dress states, adiabatic passage, and adiabatic elimination, and then. Uh, I'll cover a little bit of the initial basis of quantum information science, which is quantum state engineering, things like block sphere and uh, entanglement and qubits. I'll introduce that probably somewhere in there. Um, and then we'll get into sort of the quantum treatment of atom field interactions, which involves things like understanding what a photon is, what is field, how do you field quantize the electromagnetic field. You've probably seen that maybe in some other places. So we'll go over some of that quickly. Uh, maybe I'll just give you notes to look at that uh, in detail, and we'll try to talk about the more important things which you might not have seen, which are things like the states of the electromagnetic field, uh, Fox states, coherent states, quantum states of the electromagnetic field. And, uh, and then we'll discuss things like uh, Wigner-Weisskopf theory of spontaneous emission and Jane's coming model, which are very fundamental to understanding current research in quantum information as well. Um, and that will then, I'll come to a very theoretical section, which is this la these two parts here, which are kind of very important to understand uh, basics of decoherence, dissipation, uh, and, and so on. Uh, but they are very theoretical, and so we might go over some of that material more at a high level and keep some of the details of the calculations for either homeworks, or for uh, lecture notes, I'll try to give you the big, you know, picture view of these things. Uh, they are important if you're ever trying to follow any actual calculation in a quantum information or quantum optics paper. Um, but uh, it's probably more important to know when they can be applied, when they sort of fail, which uh, which 
formalism is more uh, expected to be applied in certain situations as opposed to other situations. And then the details of the calculation obviously are something that you just have to really you know, plug through when you want to understand it. So, um, but we'll go through all of that. Um, and then, um, yeah, and that, this is basically, this last part is essentially a continuation of the open quantum systems. And the quantum treatment uh, will discuss all the important uh, uh, cavity QED effects, which if you don't know what that means, don't worry, we'll come to that. Uh, in this class, and then um, discuss some quantum dynamics using Heisenberg, Langevin formalism, uh, homodyne detection, etc. Finally, the last, uh, as I mentioned, one third or one half of this class, uh, I'm going to discuss quantum information processing. We've already seen some basics of qubits, but then we'll talk more about the important logic elements such as quantum logic gates, quantum circuits. And then the basic uh, or the most important algorithms that are there in quantum information processing, such as these, uh, the ones that are outlined here, the Joseph Simons problem, which is the first sort of non trivial quantum algorithm, quantum Fourier transform, which is also a very important component of things like Shor's algorithm. And uh, if we have time, we'll go through some of these other ones, like quantum search and uh, quantum teleport, quantum cryptography. Uh, let's see uh, how we, how far we get. And then, uh, as I said, if we can't cover everything, what we might do is assign some of those topics to the project presentations, for example, and have you guys present that to the class. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the first. Any questions at this point? Okay, sort of ambitious plan. Hopefully, we get through most of it. Okay, so, so I decided to sort of uh, first give a little bit of background to quantum optics, uh, which is a sort of a history of the field. And uh, when you look at the history of the field, in fact, as we know, light and quantum mechanics have a very, very long uh, connection, a, a very important connection, that in fact it was by trying to understand the properties of light emission and thermodynamics of uh, light emission and absorption that many of the fundamental properties of quantum mechanics were first uh, realized. So for example, Planck, when he was trying to understand the thermal radiation, the electromagnetic spectrum that was emitted by a black body, uh, that's how he first came up with the connection or the idea that light must be emitted and absorbed in discrete quanta, which he, you know, he didn't label them, but they, which are now we call them as photons, right? And uh, Einstein was the next person who said that these quanta, so the, the difference between Planck and Einstein maybe could be summarized as Planck said that the emission and absorption process happens as uh, packets of energy, and, uh, and Einstein said no, the actual packets are actually packets of the light, the radiation field. So he said really the radiation field itself is quantized, it's not just the emission absorption process itself, but in fact the actual packets of light itself that is quantized, if you like, as a very sort of you know, hand-waving way to explain the difference, right? And from that uh, insight that the electromagnetic field or light itself comes in these packets and it's not just the interaction with atoms that is quantized, uh, he derived very important uh, phenomena such as the equilibrium between matter and uh, light and then also, of course, a very important effect such as stimulated emission which gave rise to things like lasers and, of course, the photoelectric uh, effect for which he won the Nobel Prize. The word photon itself did not arise till about 1926 uh, by Gilbert Lewis, who coined that, that phrase. So again, uh, the key role of light itself in the development of quantum mechanics, uh, in, in terms of atomic spectra, that is the other reason to understand the quantization. They had to understand how uh, light interacts with uh, atomic uh, uh, systems. And that is, of course, the basis of like uh, the work of many of these uh, famous scientists, De Broglie, Schrödinger, Dirac, Fermi, Born, etc. Um, one of the puzzling aspects of uh, quantum mechanics at the beginning was spontaneous emission. Why does an atom, which is in a uh, eigenstate of the energy, right? It's an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. If it's in an eigenstate, it should live there forever, but it doesn't. It emits spontaneously, right? So this is an important 
uh, question that was addressed by Ms. Weisskopf and Wigner, uh, who derived the uh, decay rate of an atom, which is coupled to the electromagnetic field, uh, but they use non-relativistic quantum mechanics to, to describe the spontaneous emission process. Um, I don't remember when that paper came out. You can look at that. And, and that led to the development, eventually, also of quantum electrodynamics, right? Which is a fully quantized version where everything is treated quantum, including the electrons, the positive, and, and so on, um, et cetera. And if you want a little bit more rigorous, uh, definition or sort of uh, categorization of where is classical optics, where is quantum optics, where is quantum electrodynamics. I'll come to that a little bit later in the class. I'll We can draw it actually on a nice diagram where all the regimes of quantum optics and quantum electrodynamics apply. I'll come to that. Um, so when we think about this quantum optics, as I said, uh, which is a little bit hard to define, it actually is in a very sort of narrow regime, as I'll show you in a little bit, where, where you know people wanted to talk about quantum optics as a separate subject, which is different from fully quantized relativistic treatment, which is quantum electrodynamics, right? Which is fully quantized and relativistically invariant or covariant. That is quantum electrodynamics. But for a lot of phenomena in the lab. We don't need that full quantum relativistic treatment uh, to understand phenomena. In fact, it's too much, right? The, the, the machinery of quant QED would be just way too hard to apply to a lot of phenomena in the lab. So uh, in the 1950s, uh, there were some experiments that first started to make people think about what really is quantum optics, you know, which is this understanding of uh, the theory of uh, detection, photo detection. Okay, seems like a simple thing. You know, you send photons into a detector, it produces an electrical signal, and that electrical signal is proportional to the intensity. And and you know that's how we always think about it. But when you actually look deeper into the problem, it turned out to be quite subtle. And it took uh, almost till the 1950s uh, that we finally came up with a fully quantum theory of photo detection and of the coherence, the, the property of the electromagnetic field that we call coherence, uh, to understand all of these quantum states of light that are just produced in a lab, which don't require you know, like a fully quantized and relativistic treatment of, of electromagnetism and particles and, and everything. Okay? So as I said, these experiments, the Hanbury-Brown twist experiment is one of the most famous experiments, which we will cover later on in the class. They looked at the correlations between two detectors. So they had two detectors that were measuring intensity of the light, and they looked at the correlations between these detectors, and they found something very interesting. They found some, you know, correlations that could not be easily understood. And they saw like things like bunching of photons. Eventually, people saw also things like anti-bunching. All of these important statistical statistics of these correlations had to be understood, and they were not understood until we had a fully quantum theory of the coherence of light, which was pioneered by Glauber and Sudarshan and Wolf and Mandel. Okay? And Glauber won the Nobel Prize for that uh, work. Also, the coherence uh, turns out to be important when you think about light-matter interactions. So when, uh, when you consider a, an atom that's driven by a coherent uh, light field, it undergoes certain behavior that is kind of non-intuitive, which is uh, Rabi oscillations and things like Ramsey fringes, and all of those uh, effects required some uh, explanation, which which came fairly quickly, but uh, are also part of what we consider as the quantum optics part, because they are low energy. Uh, they don't require the fully quantized treatment of uh, both, uh, or relativistic treatment of uh, electrons and positrons to understand. So all of these uh, developments in quantum optics, which included the understanding of uh, the states of light, uh, along with a better understanding of things like spontaneous emission, which was at a very sort of, you know, if you if you look back now, it kind of, it kind of seems like a very simple understanding that we had at that time of what spontaneous emission is and things like that. Uh, but when Einstein came up with it, but eventually this led to the developments of, uh, uh, along with uh, improvements in uh, in materials and so on led to uh, tunable lasers, and uh, lasers in general, and tunable lasers, 
And that led to a big flourishing of quantum optics, uh, lots of experiments that, were, uh, that had previously not been possible. So you have to understand till about like the 1960s and 1970s, we didn't have lasers. So a lot of the things that we take for granted now, when we think about like, you know, uh, fluorescence or, uh, or, uh, or the, um, uh, you know, being able to scan across a laser and uh, scan across the resonance of, a, of an atom and look at its uh, spectrum in fluorescence. And th many of these things were enabled by production of things like tunable uh, light sources or tunable coherent light sources like this. So the, um, as I mentioned, the non-classical light states, which had previously not been thought about or observed, were finally uh, observed by uh, Kimball and Mandel, and then the theory was carried out by people like Walls and Carmichael and Coerter. So this is sort of up to the 1970s and then up to the 1980s that led to another flourishing of things like nonlinear optics, uh, parametric down conversion, which is one of the main ways in which we first started to verify many of the predictions of entanglement uh, by, uh, you know, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen uh, states that many of these things were observed in these initial experiments. For example, something that's not here but is left out is by the experiment by Aspect, Aspect, where they actually did the first experiments to show that uh, EPR uh, you know, paradox or the EPR Bell states and the Bell inequalities are measured using uh, these kinds of ideas of cascades of atomic states and so on. Um, okay, and then we have, as I said, in the 80s, um, squeezed light, the first sort of non classic, another type of non classical light state, which we'll also cover in this class, was demonstrated. And then uh, the came the big uh, sort of um, experiments which involved things like atoms being coupled to cavities. Uh, and this is like saying that we have now control of both a single atom and a single photon at the quantum level. And we're observing sort of the interchange or the interplay of quantum states and quantum information between these uh, objects. And uh, that led to some very beautiful experiments. Uh, Haroche were carried out these experiments in France with microwave cavities and atoms, and then the similar experiments were carried out with atoms in optical cavities by Kimball and Rempe. And this led also, also along with uh, developments in trapped ions uh, to sort of the big successes. Oh, yeah, here we have sort of the violation of Bell's inequalities uh, that was verified by um, those people, Clauser, Aspe, and Zellinger, based on those developments in um, in, in the early 1980s. Um, and as you can see, a number of Nobel Prizes and prestigious prizes in, uh, in physics have been awarded to these uh, other developments that have come out of understanding quantum optics and atomic physics and laser physics uh, better and better. Um, I have left out here sort of the more recent ones, like uh, 20, I can't quite remember the year, but when, for example, uh, things like um, uh, the laser cooling, quantum control, and quantum computing in ion traps was done by Weinland and uh, uh, and Reiner Blatt and uh, Peter Zoller. So, uh, so those people, uh, that led to sort of now this flourishing in also quantum computing that we are seeing right now. And, and I obviously left out a lot of developments after that, including things like various superconducting qubits, solid state qubits, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, uh, one of the things, if you step back and ask ourselves what we achieved by this, uh, uh, looking at the interplay between, uh, uh, between atoms and, uh, or between two level systems, atoms in general, and photons, uh, and the interplay with photons and other uh, things is that we came up with a very, very powerful um, theoretical methodology which is called the theory of open quantum uh, systems, okay? So these open uh, quantum systems which are, as I said, as I mentioned, this a very powerful theoretical tool is a method for understanding the interaction of a small system such as an atom or a cavity 
uh, the cavity you can think of as confining a photonic field. An atom obviously is like a confined, you know, uh, system. Uh, and then with its environment, we want to understand this interaction of the of, of a con of a closed small system with this environment, the external back or the external reservoir, which could be an electromagnetic field, which could be other types of fields, etc. So this is the sort of you know, big picture of what we think about in quantum optics. We have a system that we are trying to understand, we study. We may drive the system with various tools that we have available to us. Uh, electromagnetic fields, voltages, whatever you want, will drive the system. And then the system will also be coupled to something that we call the environment. Okay? And this is the sort of the framework in which we look at a lot of problems in quantum optics. And that turns out also to be important for a lot of situations in quantum information uh, science as well. This is sort of the key, the paradigm in which a lot of quantum computing experiments are carried out. Right? So this coupled system can be reduced with very accurate uh, approximations to solving equations of motion for the system alone. So essentially what we do is we call it tracing out the bar or removing the bar. But in the process of doing that, we introduce into the system things like decoherence, dissipation, etc., etc. And this is very vital for describing things like measurement, which has, of course, been a long sought goal in quantum mechanics: is understanding measurement and describing it more accurately. It used to puzzle everyone from Bohr and Einstein and so on about what is actually measurement, and also. Uh, understanding something like decoherence. Why don't we observe systems in uh, superposition states all the time? Right? This is not to say that we have completely understood all of these problems. There is still valid fundamental research going on in all of these. But we now have a much more clear understanding of what the problems are and where we need to focus our attention. Okay? So here, for example, you have a cavity in which a photon mode is confined. And then the cavity can decay to the outside world, and we can also send in light from the outside world into the cavity. And so this is a, an example of an open quantum system. And we can measure the statistics of the light that is coming out of that uh, cavity. Same thing here with this atom. We can measure the photons that are coming out of the atom, and we can look at their statistics. So these are the types of questions that we can ask about these uh, systems. Okay. So. So where is quantum optics today? Well, really it is sort of blended into quantum information to a large extent. A lot of the fundamental problems in quantum optics now are really problems that are, uh, that are being studied or, or issues that are being studied that are, um, are relevant to understanding better quantum information science, quantum information processing. Uh, but uh, it has been uh, essentially defined in its connection to all these different experimental systems. Each of these experimental systems requires some slightly different modification or slightly different approximations of the fundamental quantum optics equations to understand it better. But So we have control now on, sys on systems at the level of single atoms, single molecules, single photons, single spin, etc. And uh, we want to understand the coupling of these uh, single atoms or single two-level systems with uh, you know, other uh, systems like that or other electromagnetic fields. So that's typically where the connection comes to optics, which is the connection to the electromagnetic field, which is, uh, which is being uh, uh, coupled to this uh, single atom, single molecule, etc. And then, of course, we can also use that to study many atoms, many, uh, 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 many two-level systems, many uh, resonators, etc. That is a you know among so so here are all sort of these applications of quantum optics right now in things like quantum computing as I already mentioned we want to better understand how to control and engineer states in quantum uh, computers uh, precision measurement is a very very important topic which maybe is not uh, talked about a lot in uh, in in uh, but is actually one of the first uh, has been one of the first applications of many of these uh, ideas from um, quantum optics, such as in quantum noise and squeezing, and making more and more precise measurements of fundamental quantities. Uh, of course, I don't need to tell you things like LIGO, um, 
which are uh, which de detected gravitational waves. That came from fundamental ideas of understanding quantum optics of light, which is circulating in a big interferometer. Okay, so and then also, as I already mentioned, fundamentals of quantum mechanics, uh, probing systems, and then studying many body physics, which is a very hot area right now, using uh, things like cold atoms, but also involving things like coupled. Uh, coupling of like many different uh, qubits to each other, many different um, uh, you know uh, uh, different types of systems that are out there for studying quantum simulation, for example. Okay. Okay. And so here's sort of a you know if you like uh, brief overview of many different uh, quantum. Uh, optics and quantum computing systems, uh, everything from like electrons up there that are trapped in a two-dimensional electron gas and are being modulated by gates to create a quantum uh, system. Some of these other things are things like nanomechanical resonators that are being coupled to uh, light or to microwave cavities. Um, we have the optics ion traps and optical traps. Uh, sorry, atomic traps, and so on. Uh, over there, clouds of Bose-Einstein condensed uh, gases that are being put into a lattice for studying many body physics. Uh, we have defects in uh, solid state materials, which is sort of my research area, which is uh, which 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 are also very promising qubit uh, candidate uh, for many applications. We have NMR, which is the first sort of ways in which we, which is a nuclear magnetic resonance of liquid molecules, of molecules in a liquid solution. That was one of the first ways in which simple quantum algorithms were carried out. And we have the superconducting qubits, which have become extremely uh, uh, hot right now as a way of uh, uh, doing quantum computing. I should mention there's, of course, other uh, research areas in quantum computing now, things like topological quantum computing and uh, measurement based quantum computing. I'm not going to be able to talk much about that. In this course, I'm still going to stick to the more, one could say, the uh, things that came out maybe more in the 1990s and 2000s, and then the very recent work in the 2010s, so to speak, which is the topological and other types of measurement based quantum computing. Uh, we might, you can certainly assign, we can certainly assign those as topics to be covered in, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the presentation. Okay. okay. That pretty much concludes this overview of uh, quantum optics and quantum information. Any questions? Very quiet. It's understanding everything. Okay. So let's jump into then a review of uh, quantum mechanics. Of course, 
uh, in quantum mechanics, we say that complete knowledge of a system is obtained if we know the wave function psi, right, or the state can psi, the state vector, and uh, this is an element of the Hilbert space, right, of the system and the universe, if you like. This is a Hilbert space of the universe. So if we know the state vector of the universe, we know everything, right? And, uh, but of course, a lot of times we're not going to try and understand the entire universe. Uh, we might uh, expand or we might construct some uh, orthonormal basis, some of the Hilbert space or some subspace of the, the Hilbert space of the universe. And we can write an expansion uh, in terms of this uh, uh, orthonormal basis, uh, which is n is a basis of this Hilbert space, right? And so then we get these expansion coefficients n psi, which you might sometimes define as cn, right? Which are the coefficients, uh, expansion coefficients of the state in the basis n. Also, you should uh, probably recall that the state psi is, is actually, in the Hilbert space, you can think of it as, as a ray, right? So it's not just a vector alone. For example, the state psi, psi, and the state alpha psi both represent the same state of the system, right? They're not different states. We don't worry about uh, them being different states of the system, okay? Where alpha, of course, can be a complex uh, number. So, okay. The probability, this is the famous Born rule, is the probability of finding the system in the state n is then simply the cn squared, right? It's just this coefficient modulo squared. And this gives rise immediately to uh, the first uh, effect, which is superpositions and interference. Which is this property that if you take the system, uh, which, and if, if you have two states of the system or the universe, which are, you know, in uh, which are both expanded along this orthonormal basis, and you have another state psi two, which is expanded along the same. I just use some dummy variables, otherwise it's called. Then, okay. Then, if you take the superposition psi one plus psi two, what you find is that the probability now p n to be in the state n is no longer just the sum of the probabilities, right, of one and two. Okay. So yeah, I mean, so this is uh, obvious, I'm sure, to everyone, but we'll just write it out. which is Pn of 1, which is modulo Cn1 squared, and Pn of 2, which is Cn2 Cn squared, right? And then the probability of being in the state n when you are in that system state psi equals psi1 plus psi2, so now psi equals psi 1 plus psi 2. And if you want to be careful, you can divide by square root of 2 and so on. Um, then the probability to be in the state n now is given not by the sum of these two probabilities, which is how most normal probabilities would work, but instead it's given by the sum square of their amplitudes. Right? And that gives rise to the interference term. We carry out that, that 
collision. And the interference term is Cn1 star C2 plus Cn1 C1 star. Okay. Right? And this is a very important, uh, obviously, the gives rise to most of the effects in quantum mechanics that are counterintuitive. Okay, so now we have talked about probabilities, but usually what we are observing in uh, experiment, in uh, any experiment, is not the wave function or the state kept directly. We are observing some physical variable, position, momentum, energy, um, you know, the magnitude of the intensity on the detector, etc. So we don't uh, observe these directly in the state cats. Instead, we are looking at some observable which is defined as an operator, right, in the Hilbert space. So, observables in, in quantum mechanics, these are Hermitian operators. on the states of the Hilbert space, okay? So a Hermitian definition, just as a reminder, is that the um, these are, when you interchange the indices, you get the complex conjugate of the, uh, of this, uh, uh, expectation, okay, and uh, the expectation value then of the observable O is simply when the system is in the state psi is this quantity, okay, and if O is diagonal in the same, in that orthonormal basis, N, then we have that O acting on N gives you some uh, value, complex number maybe. But of course, as we know, for Hermitian operators, these will turn out to be also real numbers. Okay. Again, I'm not proving many of these statements. Uh, this is just review of things you know from quantum mechanics. And the expectation value then quite simply becomes this quantity here, O n times uh, C n squared, uh, modulo C n squared. And C n squared, remember, was the probability to be in the state uh, n uh, for the system, which is in the state uh, psi. Therefore, we know that uh, this can be written as something that's much more uh, uh, analogous to classical or, or standard probability theory, which is, in standard probability theory, if you want to calculate the statistical average or the statistical uh, expectation of some variable, you will want to know all the probability for the system to be in that state or, or in that particular case. So you throw a dice, say, 10 times, and you want to know what is the expectation of, say, 5 heads or 6 heads or something. Then you will calculate the probabilities to be in those different states n, and then multiply by the value of the observable in each of those states, and then you will calculate the expectation value of that uh, observable, right? So this is the standard way to calculate expectation values in statistical physics or, or, or in statistics. And uh, in quantum mechanics also at this first level, 
when the system is just in the simple, uh, um, is diagonal in the basis n, then we immediately get, again, an expectation value that is just simply obtained by taking the value of the observable times the probability to be in that state and summing it all. Okay, so that was uh, hopefully uh, simple. And uh, also, of course, the other thing we should note is that if we have a system that is starting out in, uh, say, the state M, and we observe the value O N, and then we repeat this measurement, right? We're going to get the same value O N. It won't change. Okay. So it's not true that in in quantum mechanics that always measuring the system destroys the uh, observable. As you see, when you collapse it into an eigenstate of the observable, then you're going to keep and you repeat the measurement. You're going to keep getting the same state back again and again. Okay. So uh, that's another thing to you know that we that we should all know by now. Okay. So okay. So last part before I go into something a little different from what you might have seen earlier. Uh, just reminding you that that is that the uncertainty principle comes about because operators do not right. So if you have two operators A and B. You have two operators A and B, and the commutator is some third operator C. Okay. Then, uh, if C is not equal to zero, then A and B do not have the same eigenstates. And this is where we start to get the. Um, the problem that if you measure one of these observables, then the other one starts is collapsed into some superposition of the of its um, uh, of its uh, states, and therefore you cannot get a definite value or or the uncertainty in that value changes. Okay, so then uh, from this relationship we can derive the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is delta A times delta B is greater than or equal to I over two times the expectation value of C, where delta A is defined as the statistical quantity, which is square root A minus A expectation um, square expectation. Okay? And delta B is defined similar. Okay, again, stuff that you've all seen in quantum mechanics. So that brings us now to the important thing that we all uh, care about in any quantum uh, information system or quantum computing system, which is time evolution. Because you know, typically a quantum computer or quantum information processor, etc., you will set it up and you will let time go from left to right and watch the computation unfold. So we need to understand what happens to a quantum system as time evolves in the computation or in any particular physical process. So time evolution then is the first thing that we need to write down. Again, this is mostly review, but I'll start introducing some new stuff at the end of this. Or maybe it's new, I don't know. Maybe you guys have already seen it, but we'll, we'll discuss that. Yeah, I can go faster. Well, I should start moving these boards around so that I don't. It is stuff. So time evolution the first way in which we look at time evolution, which is the first way in which time evolution is introduced uh, in, um, in, the, uh, in quantum mechanics is in what we call the Schrodinger picture, right? And that comes through the Schrodinger equation. 
which is ih bar do over do t times psi is equal to h hat times psi, right? Where h hat is the Hamiltonian of the system, okay? And typically you'll get the Hamiltonian typically from some classical analogy to the, um, to the dynamics of the system or to the energies of the system. Um, but we want to define it in this general way where h is the Hamiltonian. And so what we can think about is h is the Hamiltonian that generates time evolution of the system. Uh, h is the operator that generates time evolution. By knowing h, we know how the system evolves in time. Okay? And uh, the important solutions, as we have already mentioned, we call first, we find the stationary solutions, right? Stationary because the probability, once you are in this state, the probability does not change once you are in that state, right? And that's because hn times en equals en is an eigenvalue of the um, of the Hamiltonian, right? So. So if we expand any state psi in eigenstates, let's say at psi at time zero, we expanded it in eigenstate in, in terms of these eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, right? Then from these equations, we can derive that psi n at some time p is equal to summation n e to the minus i e n t over h bar times cn times e, right? And so if you started, of course, in the state, say e1 or e2, whatever, ground state or excited state, etc., then the probability will only be multiplied by this phase factor, e to the minus i e n t over h bar, which means that the probability to be in that state will not change, okay? It will stay in that state in a, as time goes on, okay? because the modulo squared is still the same as the original CN, okay? And then if you are in a superposition, then of course you're gonna get interference terms of all those different uh, states. Okay. We can also formally integrate this equation, okay? This equation here, I can, I can imagine that it's just like any other equation, and I can integrate it uh, in this way, right? Psi of t, equal to exponential minus i h t over h bar, okay, psi of zero, which I will define to be the time evolution operator. Okay. So time t from zero up to t is the time evolution operator. And we can know what this uh, operator looks like if we expand it again in the system where you know we know that h itself is diagonal in its um, eigenbasis, right? So if we write h as a matrix, right, with these uh, in this expansion, this is a matrix, uh, and in that matrix expansion, E n will be on all the diagonals. And therefore, this exponential can be easily evaluated, right? Because exponential of, this is a matrix now, so we have to do matrix exponentiation of this uh, system. So that's how you can think about like what would actually be involved in calculating the time evolution operator is that it's the equivalent to exp exponentiating a matrix, right? And that's, uh, you know, uh, something that's, well known how to do. Okay. Okay. Now we have introduced a Schrödinger picture because that's how time evolution is normally carried out, and I've written down the time evolution operator there. But I want to 
now introduce some other pictures of kind of I will leave this up here. Maybe I'll just write down the time evolution operator. T T minus zero is equal to e to the minus i h t over h bar. Okay. And now I will introduce the Heisenberg picture, which probably you've also all seen. And the interaction picture again, this is all you know review of things you would have probably learned in quantum mechanics. Everybody has seen this? Interaction, Heisenberg pictures and stuff. Right. Okay. So in this picture, the state vector describing the state of the system does not evolve. Right? The state vector stays the same, and rather the observables that are describing the measurements on the system, the things that we are interested in, that we are actually looking at, the physical variables, those are the things that are evolving. Okay? So they depend on time, and they evolve according to Heisenberg's equation of motion. Again, I'm not deriving any of this, but I'm just saying that in this picture, it's the observables that change. So notice that in the earlier, picture when I calculated the probabilities, oh, it was all the time evolution was built into the system, uh, into the into the coefficient cm, for example. Okay, So in this case, the, the time evolution is built into the observable itself. And this can be helpful, as we'll see later on, when we are dealing with different types of uh, uh, forced uh, harmonic oscillator or different types of driving of uh, systems. And uh, so, if you take if you take an eigenstate of this observable, of O, so notice now that this is an eigenstate of O, which is not an eigenstate of H, not necessarily an eigenstate of H, the Hamiltonian. Let's call this eigenstate L, Lj, um, or maybe I should have called it O, but I'm just Choosing a slightly different symbol here, L. Okay. Okay. So Lj is an eigenstate of the observable O with an eigenvalue Lj. Okay. Then remember we had introduced this uh, uh, time evolution operator T, right? Then if you substitute that, you will find that these eigenstates of T of the of the observable O will transform according to the time evolution operator in backwards fashion. So going from T back to T naught or zero, whatever you want to call it, T back to zero times Lj of time zero. Okay. Or equivalently, you can say that Lj at time zero, I can say will transform and I put this over bar over these guys here, sorry, I forgot to put the over bar here. They represent the Heisenberg uh, you know versions of these basis states. Of course, at time p equal to zero, the Heisenberg states and the uh, regular Schrodinger states will coincide with each other. If I now differentiate that equation for the eigenheads of O, I get a differential equation for the um, for these eigenvalues. Okay. So let me differentiate this equation, right? Um, this one, sorry. Then I get d over dt of t t zero times Lj of t 
with the over bar. And then I pull over that guy to the left hand side and differentiate that P of T zero, D by DP, LJ of T. Because this guy on the left hand side, if this is the uh, ket at time t equal to zero, has no time derivative, right? The one at time t equal to zero is constant. So it, its time derivative vanishes, is equal to zero. Okay. And then using, using the time evolution operator's definition, Substitute that back in here, we get I S bar D by D T L J of T is equal to minus H L J of T. So remember in the Schrodinger picture, when we uh, looked at the evolution of the state cap it evolved with a plus sign for h, right? That's the definition of, that's the Schrodinger equation. Right, the Schrodinger equation, the state cat rotated with plus h times psi of, psi, psi at some other time. Here, the observable, right, and its uh, corresponding uh, eigenstates, right, the eigenstates of the, of the observable are rotating in the opposite sense from the Schrodinger equation. That's the basic thing because we get this minus sign for the a, for the time evolution of the eigenstates of the observable, because okay. any observable, right, in its in its uh, eigenbasis l1, l2, etc., say lm, will be diagonal, right. And what I'm saying is that as we evolve in time, that this is going to now come in with a minus sign on the Hamiltonian. Okay. So as we evolve this operator in time, is going to have this opposite behavior from the Schrodinger states. Okay, moving on to now the final picture, which is the interaction picture that we'll use. If you didn't follow the derivation again, I mean, you know, it's something you can review from your uh, textbooks. In the Schrodinger picture, we put all of the time evolution into the state vector, and the operators are just standing still. And then at the end, when we want to calculate an observable expectation, we just take the operator and sandwich it between the between the, uh, the eigenkets or the state vector, right? So psi of t is varying with time, and O, the observable, stands still, has no time evolution in the Schrodinger picture. In the Heisenberg picture, what we have said is, that all of the time evolution is in the observable O. So O in this in this guy is going to evolve in time. So it's going to have some uh, you know change as time goes on. And the state cat psi of zero is whatever it was that we initially prepared the system at the beginning. And we'll imagine that it's the observables that are changing. In the interaction picture, we're going to do a hybrid of both of those. Okay. And the reason for that, of course, is because we are going to have the system which is being subjected to some uh, forces, for example, and the forces may be time dependent, and initially the system, we understood the system very, very well without those external forces that were acting on it, okay? So what we want to do is we want to get rid of any of the trivial time dependence, the time dependence that comes from the things that we understand very well, as an example, let's say a harmonic oscillator, we understand very well what the time dependence of that system is. Okay, we know all the details of the harmonic oscillator, how it's going to behave, but now imagine that we force it, we apply some forcing term to it. Okay, uh, Then, now we want to understand, focus, 
only on the part of the system which is due to the forcing and not worry about all the stuff that came before that which is the uh, part that we you know we understand very well which is the fundamental Hamiltonian of the harmonic oscillator. So, so we write the Hamiltonian H as having two parts H0 plus V. Okay? And in general both H0 and V can be time dependent, right? Both H0 and V could be functions of time. Although more typically H0 will be time independent and V will be the time dependent part. Okay? Okay, so I'm debating whether we should go through the whole uh, derivation here. Why don't we stop here with the interaction picture and I'll come back to it in the next class. So, so this is probably one of the more, most important pictures that we'll be using a lot in quantum optics also. Because, as I've explained already, in quantum optics, we're going to have uh, systems, for example, like an atom, right? And we know the fundamental Hamiltonian of the atom, H0, very, very well. So we're going to, like, you know, divide up the system as having a part which is H0, and then a part which is V, which is the uh, whatever perturbation that we're doing to it, which may include things like interaction with the environment. And we will want to understand more specifically what happens to the evolution of the system under the action of these perturbations. Okay. And that's why we use this interaction feature a lot. So I'll come back to that, or maybe I can even just distribute the nodes because this is probably something that you're all quite familiar with and I don't necessarily need to um, go through the derivation of it very carefully. Uh, instead what I'll do maybe is just start with an example in the next class of how to apply the interaction. And I'll give you guys the nodes of you know the interaction picture derivation because it's something you probably have seen already. So, all right. Okay, so we'll see you all in the next time. Anybody else didn't get syllabus? Oh, actually, we have a few minutes, right? I didn't get to know any of your names. Can we, like, quickly go through and, like, you know, I'll just get to at least know who was in the class. Why don't you sit back now? Sorry. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh, I made you come back. <laughs> Alright, why don't you just go around tell me which year your your name, which year you're in, and if you're working in a research group or not. I'll start um, with you. I'm Pinay, yes. 30 years. I'm working with uh, Michael Hattridge. Okay. <laughs> Oh, uh, I'm, also, I'm second year and I'm also working with Dr. Patrick. Okay. Um, Dr. Khan, I'm working with uh, Dr. Patek. With Dr. Patek? Yeah. And which year are you in? Uh, third year. Third year. Okay. okay. And in third year. Okay. I'm Namita. I'm in third year. I'm working with Dr. Patek. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, I'm Evan. I don't go here. Just <laughs> He's an undergraduate. Yeah, that's okay. I'm seeing you. I'm a third year. I'm with Sankarani. Okay. Uh, my name is Hall. I'm the fifth year. I work with uh, Sergei Paul. Okay. Um, Paul, I'm in my seventh year. I work with Dr. Sergei Paul. Okay. Uh, I know you. <laughs> but okay, introduce yourself. <laughs> uh, I'm Chen Xu from uh, Professor Chen Xu from Harvard University. And this is my sixth year. I'm Bela, I'm just already in class. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, great. Hopefully, I'll make you know.